Welcome everyone to Reddit Chats by Texocity. I really don't know how to like do this, but anyways, Texocity slash Reddit Chats presented by the Two Tank Culture Podcast and Pop Culture Radio on YouTube. You remember when Yahoo was like Yahoo? Of course, that was like the old age. All you youngins don't know shit. Y'all don't know shit. Welcome back. Part three is called The Death of an Ambulance Chaser. You kind of have an idea of what went down. And yeah, it's pretty fucking crazy. So I'm just going to jump right into it. Grab a drink, grab a snack, and listen to my wonderful voice tell this fucking story. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but your friend Lenny is dead. There isn't a role I usually play. Most of the time when someone gets into my ambulance, I can predict pretty accurately if they're going to make it or not. But I'm not the one who has to break the news to people. It's not easy. But as far as I know, Lenny didn't suffer. My name's Farouk, not Enrique, by the way. I know Lenny's racist ass could never remember my name, but he could have at least gotten the right continent. As you might know, Lenny hasn't been seen in about a week. But as of right now, I'm pretty sure I'm the only one who knows he isn't just missing. I'm the only one who's talking anyway. And I'm guessing that's the way it's going to be for a while. As far as anyone else knows, his car turned up abandoned a few miles from his house. He rented a car they still haven't found. And he was last seen leaving a sleazeball motel. A woman who works for his law firm called the police And now they've been poking around everywhere and asking lots of questions. If Lenny had just asked me, I could have let him know that something has been messed up around here for a while. Probably longer than anyone on my side has noticed, since medics don't stay involved past the hospital doors very often. That being said, you pick up on little things, like critical patients being wheeled off in the wrong direction. You hear rumors, too. Rumors about people who seemed fine either dying or who never made it into the hospital's paperwork at all. Yesterday, I was wondering whatever became of old Lenny Chapman, like the rest of you, when I got a strange call from dispatch for a non-emergency transport. I don't usually deal with those kinds of rides. It's lots of old people going in for surgery and the like, but... I was already in overtime and it sounded a hell of a lot better than the shit I usually deal with. There was a nurse with the patient, so it would just be me driving to the suburbs and taking them back to the hospital. It ended up being way the hell out in Haddonfield, like 40 minutes from Camden. Haddonfield is one of the richest spots in all of Jersey, but the area they sent me was the rich part of that rich town. Rich, like they sent me down a street where the smallest place you'll pass puts the White House to shame. The place I was headed to was far from the smallest place out there, too. I went up a driveway longer than the street I live on, all lined with trees like the place has its own country road, and at the end was a mansion big enough for three rappers and Jeff Bezos. Picture Wayne Manor, or that place where the X-Men live, then add a dozen or so rooms to it, and you still aren't close. The top of the driveway ended in a big circle lined with Rolls Royces and Bentleys that I drove past as I pulled up to the massive marble staircase leading to the front door. There were two people waiting for me, and neither of them looked like a nurse to me. I had an uneasy feeling as I got out of the ambulance and greeted them. A tall, droll guy dressed like a butler from a hundred years ago and a woman in an evening dress. Both of them were wearing masks over their mouths and noses and I put mine on as well. Thank you for coming, the woman said. She looked familiar and had an accent I couldn't place. We're a few minutes behind. Why don't you come in? I'll just wait outside if it's all the same to you, I said with an uneasy feeling rising inside me. Nonsense, she said. Come in out of the cold. As I spoke, the man held out one arm and wrapped it around my shoulder and gestured up the stairs with the other. We entered the massive double doors that looked like they'd been carved straight out of a thousand-year-old oak and entered a foyer that could have held my apartment and then some. As we walked across the polished floor, the butler's shoes clapped a slow, steady rhythm before several more servants joined in the shadows. 
The woman hovered closely to me, and I was as certain that I'd seen her recently somewhere, and even more certain that I didn't want to be there. At the other end of the room, the butler paused and opened a door, then stood aside, and the woman led me through into a cavernous dining hall. It was dim, and what light there was flickered off the distant walls and dark marble floor. As my eyes adjusted, I could see that the only light was coming from a fireplace. Framed in the far wall to my left were a roaring fire cast dancing shadows onto every surface. A table that had to be 20 feet long stretched out before me was covered with glistening silver platters and dishes, each piled with feast-like proportions. As I stepped in and my eyes adjusted, I saw figures too. A crowd of dozens standing on the outskirts of the firelights where the flame flickered against their porcelain white mask. Masks. They were wearing strange masks like those you might see children wear. And they covered their eyes and most of their noses, but left their mouths and nostrils exposed. There's no reason for concern, Mr. Muda, sir, the woman said, sliding off her N95. We're hosting a dinner party, as you can see, and your patient is not ready for transport. Have you eaten? The fact was, I hadn't, and the aromas wafting off the table reminded me of that. But I was in no mood for food. The crowd of masked diners in their evening wear looked on, and what had been an uneasy feeling was turning to downright fear. All I wanted to do was get out of there, with or without the transport. That's kind of you, I said as she moved closer to the table, but I'd like to get the patient and be on my way. Of course, she said with a nod. I heard the tapping of shoes on polished stone and turned to see one of the servants behind me disappear through a door. Alphonse will see to the patient. But that still leaves you time for nourishment. I still couldn't place the accent. Something European. But something about it only added to the atmosphere of the place. I slowly shook my head, but she ignored me and gestured to one of the platters on the table. It was covered in what looked like steak or lamb. We have here some of the tender... Uh, I'm gonna mispronounce it. Chateaubriand. <laughs> cooked rare, if you'd like. Only the most tender cuts were used. I looked at the arrangement of rare steaks before, and then back at the woman. She looked incredibly familiar. I'm sorry, do, do I know you from somewhere? I wondered how much longer the patient would be, and she moved on to another dish. Perhaps, she said before waving her hand over something more exotic looking. Burke's well, crusted, sous vide sweetbread, cooked slowly at a low temperature, and served with bone marrow butter. This is among our chef's specialties. Behind her, one of the guests moved forward, helped himself to a plate, and began selecting items from the table. Others followed, and soon many of them were fawning over the array of varied and sumptuous offerings. I really, really do need to be going, I protested in a croak. She smiled. <laughs> There's no cause for concern, Mr. Mudiser. Really, there isn't. She turned and called to another one of the servants. Liam, please see to it that Mr. Mudiser is ready to depart soon. I am pronouncing that correctly, I trust? Yes, I nodded. Thank you. Wonderful now, she said. Moving on to the next platter. This is really something quite special. Almond rice puree and flesh with pickled kohlrabi and saffron, she said. Would you care to try some? It was a particularly strange presentation she was referring to. Twist of battered meat sitting atop what looked like a risotto. At this point, the masked dinner guests all slowly nibbled from small portions on china tasting plates, and every eye was fixed on me. As the smells wafted through the air, I became hungrier with every breath, and the reality was that I was starving. But I shook my head. She seemed to pout. I, I stammered, I, I really must be going. Of course, she said with a nod towards a dark doorway, through which I could not see. Your patient approaches, but first, the main course. I heard footsteps behind me and turned to see half a dozen servants wheeling in a black cloth-covered cart with glistening platters atop it. They came to a stop at the end of the table and began placing the gleaming silver onto the table. As they did, she selected a teacup from the table pressed a spoon onto it, and slowly stirred. This is heart tea served cold. 
she said as she lifted the spoon and its dripping red contents into her mouth. It really is more of a jelly. Heart? Tea? I've heard about people eating some fucked up things, but this was getting to me. Oh, yes, she said as she visibly savored it. Mr. Mudiser, you're in the company of the Bazarab Tasters Club, seekers of the rarest and most exotic delicacies the world has to offer. My patient. I trilled off as my stomach weakened. Of course, she nodded. With travelers from all over the world, I suppose it was inevitable that one would require medical attention. And thank you so much for helping us attend to him. Do you care for ribs? Among the new platters added to the table was an arrangement of short ribs around a domed platter covering. After waving her hand over them, she turned to me, placed her hand on the ornate handle of the silver globe, and lifted it to expose the platter beneath. By the chin, I knew what was coming. The pudgy tuft of skin under the maxilla was the first thing I noticed, and it was one of those strange moments where the brain copes with the strange and horrible by seeking refuge in the familiar... And for a split second, I almost shouted, Oh, hey, Lenny. Of course I didn't. And by the time she had lifted away the cloche, I had recognized that Lenny's head was sitting atop a silver splatter, surrounded by small circular cuts of purple and violet marbled meats. Tete de avocat, prepared in an ice bath for presentation in plating, accompanied by cervelle de avocat for the diner's pleasure. She finished my motioning to the strange meats laid out in front of Lenny's head, and I retched, stumbled backwards, and almost fell into two waiting butlers who placed their massive hands gently but firmly on my shoulders with a vice-like grip. The Basarab Tasters Club has existed for hundreds of years and will exist for hundreds more, despite the efforts of this interloper. The dinner guests had now surrounded the head and were fawning over it, and one of them, a young woman wearing the cartoon-like countenance of a wolf, picked up a piece of Lenny's brain and ate it. Exquisite, the young woman said. What praise do I hear? A new voice came from behind, and there were more footsteps as a man approached from the shadows. As he stepped into the light, the flames played off his plate. Painted face, a flimmering silver buckle hung from two leather strands between his collars, and he smiled a horrible smile. Frankly, though, with people like Lenny around, it can be very difficult to source fresh meats. He spoke in the most unnervingly casual tone. My understanding is you had an arrangement with him, which I'm sorry to say is at an end. I looked back at the woman who had led me in here, and finally, I recognized her. She's a nurse, a nurse at St. Mary's. What the fuck is happening? I knew, but this was all I could muster. Mr. Mudiser, do you think you'd still be alive at this moment if we were simply planning to kill you? The pale-faced man looked at me with an expression that told me the question was not rhetorical. Mr. Mudiser, it's increasingly difficult to deal publicly through hospitals. Doctors are quite expensive and they're paid to save people. But would you believe that they're substantially more so when they're paid to simply let them die? The woman then joined the pale one in the quizzical glare and soon I realized the diners were still watching as well as they continued to graze over what remained of Lenny on the table. What? what? What do you want from me? I know. God, I already knew. Is it not clear? She asked. Why not cut out the middleman, so to speak? We'd like to duplicate your arrangement with, well, the entree. But instead, we'd like to simply bring the flesh, but nearly departed souls to a location of our choosing. I was silent. Stunned. All we need from you is a fair price for your services, the man said. He was in silent for a moment, and when I did not speak, he spoke again, now gesturing to the table. Of course, if not, there's always room for one more. Five thousand! I blurted out. Done, she said after a pause. Our dinners are on Saturdays, and 48 hours to prepare our dishes are quite appreciated. We will be hosting our Germanic chapter next Saturday, and they require much more corpulent stock than most. No earlier than Wednesday afternoon? No later than Thursday evening. Are in the agreement? Y yes, I said hoarsely. A fee accord, she said and snapped her fingers. And with that, the two butlers shuffled me out of the room and away from the diners, through the entryway and out the door into my ride. The massive oak door slammed behind them. And suddenly, 
the wind through the trees, and my own beating heart was all I could hear. And that's it, I guess. I never thought to ask how Lenny ended up on the dinner table, and I don't plan to. But what matters is that he isn't coming back anytime soon. I'm sure he was a fighter, but I've seen lots of fighters in my time. I'm a fighter too. All I can say, if you end up riding in my ambulance and things aren't looking good for you, maybe give up on that fight before we get to the final destination because it's best you don't win the fight before you lose the fight to dinner. Either that or give me five grand because it's not like it really matters to me where the money comes from. Plus, I'm a vegetarian. Dang, R.I.P. Lenny. He died. Motherfucker died. I wish they kind of would have told us what happened also because it would have been nice to know. But I was really rooting for you, Lenny. We were all rooting for you. <laughs> this is part three of the ambulance chaser. I hope you guys really enjoyed it. Let me know if you guys want to listen to something specific next. And I will be going to my regular cases soon. I'm just trying to get some content out for you guys. Definitely subscribe to Tutan Culture and to Pub Culture Radio so that you guys do not miss an episode of the Texocity series, especially my Reddit chats. And with that being said, my name is Donna and I will see you guys later. Bye.